50 year long crisis holy shit are they talking about my life hey there guys all right today we are back with some more overly sarcastic production and i thought you know what i'm sick i don't want to end up recording an hour long trope talk and destroying my voice so we're gonna watch history summarized ancient persia today before we dive in, make sure you go and check out the links in the description box below. I would love it if you joined the Discord and followed me over at Twitch. Okay. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and dive into Persia. If you, like me, learned about the Persian Wars from the Greek perspective, or have even so much as heard of the movie 300, you might be inclined to view the Persian Empire as some kind of first order level big bad, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. Persia is often branded as the antagonist because of the wars with Greece and the general Hellenistic-centric take on that particular branch of ancient history, but I hope that I can show you why... E and well, kind of the Hellenistic-centered... Uh, uh, because again, Eurocentrism um, would of course put, you know, Persia being from Asia, right? Even someone like me, a full-on Hellenist classicist who loves ancient Greece more than he loves most people, can see that Persia has a fascinating and amazingly unique history that's so much more than just being the bad guy in a Zack Snyder movie. Mesopotamian history before Persia is certainly interesting, but it's easily its own topic, so I'll skip it. For now, just know that it existed. Our story begins in the mid-500s BC. The big kid in town was the Median Empire, and they had a reputation for being mean to their subjects. So some people to the south, Persians, and in particular this guy Cyrus, wanted to have a go at conquering them. Cyrus didn't really have a big arm. Okay, show of hands, who wants to overthrow the empire? Ooh, ooh, me. Pick me. Kind of, uh, getting Aztec vi- uh, the overthrow of the Aztec, uh, vibes going on here army, but he was smart, and he garnered a lot of military and political support from some of the annoyed Median nobility. He managed this by promising his- I pinky promise we will all stay best buds after this. ...new allies that their people would be treated as full equals of the Persians, and unlike some other empires I could name, he actually followed through. Not hmm. only that, but when he defeated the Medians, he made a point to forgive his defeated enemies and treated them as equals as well. But wait, there's more! <gasps> Uh, yeah. Thank you, infomercial version of Blue. Anyway, in the following years, he crossed the Tigris River and conquered the Babylonians. And not only was he nice to the Babylonians too, he famously freed their captive Jewish population and helped them build the Second Temple. Which just... wow. Cyrus definitely wins my award for the nicest world-conquering empire builder in history. And those two things don't usually go together, so props to Cyrus for actually pulling it off. And if you know your Herodotus, you'll also know the story of Croesus, king of Lydia, which actually happened seven years before the conquest of Babylon, but details. So yeah. this guy, Croesus, is rich. Stupid rich. Croesus boarded the newfound Achaemenid Persian Empire, and each one wanted to conquer the other. Croesus, a Greek, wanted to be sure of his chances, so he got an oracle from Delphi that said, Oh great King Croesus, if you attack the Achaemenid Persian Empire, you will destroy a great empire. And then he thought, huh, well I guess that settles that, and attacked. Unfortunately and destroyed for his him, empire. the oracle, being Trixie as always, didn't tell him that it was Trixie oracles is is his own empire that would be destroyed? So Cyrus, being the clever military tactician that he was, defeated Croesus and conquered the whole of Anatolia. In the long run, this is going to end up coming back to bite Persia in the ass, but for now, good for them. Hmm. And like we said, the Achaemenid Persians conquered Babylon, and Cyrus had himself a merry little empire. And nice. by little, I mean it was bloody huge. No empire in history had been so sprawling before this. That thing ran from the Indus Valley all the way to the Hellespont. Damn. But we're actually not done yet. After Cyrus died, his son Cambyses conquered Egypt. The Egyptians were less than thrilled because Cambyses did not share his father's kindness, as Ooh. he famously killed the super, super sacred bull of Apis, among many That's not other bad. Imprisoning their king, burning the mummies of their ancestors, and looting temples, as you do. Well, shit, that's not good. Bad things. Cambyses was later assassinated and replaced by Darius I, who put things back on track. Nice. His first order of business was suppressing a series of revolts that resulted from the assassination, and with only a small army, against all odds, he actually did it. Okay, nice. so now that the Persian Empire is all nice and resettled, I should say that they had a fantastic system of bureaucracy. 
The great king or king of kings like Cyrus or Darius was the ruler of all of the empire. Local power, however, was delegated to a series of satraps, mini-kings picked from the local nobility who ruled the 50-odd Persian provinces, like a governor. In 498 BC, a collection of Ionian Greek city-states on the coast of Anatolia revolted from Persia. And in regards to the satraps, I'm a little rusty on this information because it's been like three years um, since I wrote this essay where I did a where I had to do a bunch of research on the Achaemenid Empire and all their empires. Um, but the satraps, if I'm from what I'm remembering. Satraps could largely govern themselves how they traditionally could, and this is then a method that Alexander would take uh, when conquering, as I'm sure we've talked about on this channel before in pre other videos relating to this time period. Um, Alexander comes in, he essentially keeps the Persian form of governance. As long as they did not rebel against him or, um, you know... Uh, they would get to keep their standing government. The nobles would essentially get to stay in nobility and in power, uh, so long as they did not go against Alexander or try and stab him in the back. Um, and of course, once they rebelled and he found out about it, he came in, burned the shit out of them, killed them, and then his he would choose the government. Uh, they wouldn't be able to really govern themselves. So, yeah, it's a really, it's oddly. Like, I'm part of me is curious and wants to know, like, how, why this form of government became unpopular. Because really, no one does it. Well, I feel like maybe it's the Romans to blame. Because the Romans were a bit of control freaks, and they were the next big empire after the Persians and then Alexander the Great. Huh. Partially for political reasons, but also because the Ionians and company didn't much care for the rulers that Persia had chosen to govern them. But whatever the case, there was a revolt, which is what's important here. Eventually, Athens got involved, as the narrative turned from the initial politics more towards, hey, let's fight the oppressive and evil Persians for our freedom. It's understandable to see why the message changed the way it did in this particular situation, but it misrepresents Persia on the whole. Fight for freedom? Fine. But oppressive and evil? Hardly. There is a yeah. mountain of evidence to how much Cyrus and Darius did for the well-being of all the people in their empire. Not only were they welcoming of multiple different cultures, they restored buildings, created roads in a postal system, promoted education, and were notably egalitarian in women's rights. Now, you can't guarantee that the satrap of your particular province isn't going to do something stupid and mean, which is unfortunately exactly what happened to the Ionians, but all things considered, living in the Persian Empire was pretty great. If you're from somewhere that's part of the Western classical tradition, like, say, America, you might have a different, more aggressive, warmonger-y picture of Persia because of the Ionian Revolt and the subsequent wars with Greece. Which, by the way, while I don't have the time to get into the detail here, if you would like to learn more about the Persian Wars, please go check out this video on Greek history. So. Anyway, while all of those anti-Persia sentiments are valid for Greeks, it's unfair and flat-out incorrect to think that the entire empire was just plain evil. The Athenian playwright Aeschylus wrote his play The Persians specifically to humanize them in the aftermath of the Battle of Salamis. So if even he thinks that there's more to Persia than a couple of wars, surely we can all make an effort to see them for what they really are. The Persians were the first and arguably one of the most successful examples of a fair, multi-ethnic, internally peaceful, and prosperous nation. And that's seriously impressive. Even calling them Persia kind of does- This is one of the things in it, like, it's, it's, it's hard, it's, how do I want to word this? <laughs> it's part of, I think, the issue that we have here when it comes studying this time period um is also our modern conceptualization of and really the colonial time period is to blame here the modern conceptualization of one empire um and two why people then rebel against said empires and um why um, right, because the modern conceptualization of empire 
really, if you think there are there are two things that are going to come to your mind, you're going to think of the colonialist uh, empires of the uh, 17th to 20th century, or you are going to think of Rome. And Rome is, and both of those examples are rather oppressive empires. Now, of course, you could also end up thinking of like the Chinese empire, Chinese dynasties. But that's Western, in terms of Western uh, talk, the, those are going to be the prevalent, especially in America, the prevalent empires that jump into people's minds uh, on an average. And so because of that, I think that then gives a, uh, a bias, right, towards um, one making it much easier to view and assume the Achaemenid Empire as being a cruel empire. Now, of course, empires are empires, and they're, in my opinion, always bad. Um, however... The Achaemenid Empire, in the way it chose to govern and its leniency, it's it could be one of the least bad. I don't know, like maybe maybe top five least bad empires in history. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Um, and then another part of that, because of our modern conceptualizations, of empires and stuff like that, when it comes to general knowledge especially in american schools in western schools in western teaching in middle school high school when you talk about this time period and we're talking about the you know beginnings of greece right because again democracy you got to talk about that there isn't time to really go in depth about it and of course, also your history prof your history teachers at those levels are not going to be ancient Persian historians. That's not they. That is most likely not the time period that they wrote their thesis on. So therefore, they may not know about much. Um, and so they may be trying to do their best, but of course, they have a limited time period to talk about a bunch of information that the state wants them to talk about. Um, and so, and then again, because of how humans work, most people are not then going to further pursue history because it's not what they're interested in. Maybe they want to go, you know, do math, science, different stuff, right? Um, and so because of that, the majority of the people are only going to have that br brief information. And so that's another reason why Persia I think it gets the uh gets the modern rap here that it does and then of course pop culture does not help does them a disservice because persians were only one of the empire's many peoples back to the point all that cooperation and trans-imperial trade made persia fabulously rich as the abundance of art statuary and palaces should indicate and also the justice system in persia was extensive and effective at ensuring fair treatment for all Persia had a rich cultural heritage as well, in part relating to its tradition of Zoroastrianism, the main Persian religion. Zoroastrianism is a complex monotheistic belief system that heavily stresses duality between good and evil, and arguably played a strong part in influencing the later development of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It's easily its own topic, but for now, just know that it existed. All in all, the century and a bit following the formation of the empire was pretty great, but things deteriorated as a result nice, of disputes nice. over the throne, as monarchies are wont to do. Yep. Conflicts in the later 5th century left central power somewhat weakened, and the strength of the empire continued to fray through the fall. Well, you could argue that from the very onset of the establishment of Persia here, of the Achaemenid Empire, the very establishment in pretty much ensured a weakened central government. Um, and so, essentially, for the Achaemenid Empire to continue as it was under Darius and Cyrus, what they needed was they needed to constantly have a continued line of extremely capable king of kings. And that is just something that, obviously, as we know, monarchs are not good at ensuring. Um, so, yeah, and so, like, if you're not having another Cyrus or Darius level of smarts, 
the central government's going to be fucking weak, right? Um, because those form that this form of government. Th this is like this is the main problem with this form of government. When it has a capable central, when it has a capable king of king, king of kings in charge, then it is an extremely effective form of government, right? But then when the more likely happens, the more common, the average ruler comes in, or the slightly weaker ruler, the central government is going to be completely ineffectual. And then, of course, this goes into perhaps why Rome decides to govern the way it does, because with the Roman style of governance, that essentially eliminates it increases central governance so now the central government does not have to entirely worry um about a weak ruler ruining everything right with because they have a stronger central government so they don't have to worry about the issues that the ecumenists worry about form of governments baby because democracy gets rid of you know democracy you typically do not get the um as effective of a government as what uh if we best case scenario king like amazing king super smart super brilliant whatever you wouldn't you're not going to get that in democracy but you're not going to get the henry the eighth or uh you know richard the lionhearts or king john you know the ones that kind of fuck shit up or um charles King Charles and King James, those four. Um, you don't end up needing, you don't also end up having that, right? So you kind of get that, in, you're stuck in the in-between, right? Which is why democracy is the uh, best of the bad choices. Because <laughs> all, all, all forms of governance are pretty shit. <laughs> following century, and ultimately the weakened military failed to stop the invasion of Alexander the Splendid. And then in under a decade, just like that, the Achaemenid and Persian Empire was done. Okay, this Alexander's conquest definitely a very summarized version of the fall of the Achaemenids, okay. Quest in itself will be its own video soon enough, but I'll just say now that he conquered Persia, and following his death, the Macedonian Seleucid Kingdom ruled for 200-ish years of steady decline until the Parthians swooped in from behind the Caspian Sea and ganked back Persia. By the time Parthia was on the scene in the latter 2nd century BC, Greek power in Persia, Egypt, and Greece itself had succumbed to infighting, and was mostly replaced with the Romans, fresh from their victories in the Punic Wars. The Parthian Empire was a big center for trade and commerce between Asia and the Mediterranean, and this was especially lucrative because the Romans really enjoyed their Chinese silk. One of the distinct features of the Parthian Empire was how it reacted to its environment, because the world was really changing. Although Greek power was on the decline, Greek culture, which was spread through the conquests of Alexander, was still widely popular. Many people living in the Parthian Empire were Greek, and the Parthian culture was very much a mix of Persian and Greek culture in one. Parthian kings were even known to write the word Philhellene, or lover of Greece, in Greek on their coins. And not only were the Parthians kind to Greeks and Greek culture, the Parthian Empire continued the Achaemenid tradition of respecting all of the cultures and peoples in their empire. Medians, Jews, you name it. Conflict started happening when Rome expanded eastward in the centuries after Caesar, looking for more land and also probably wanting a direct line to the silk trade. Famously, the Parthians killed Crassus and company in 53 BC, which then opened up the door to a flood of Roman generals who wanted to succeed where Crassus had failed. And part of the difficulty for the Romans in dealing with these guys was their army. The Parthians were working with mounted archers, which was a serious pain for the Roman infantry to deal with. Not only was combat on open terrain likely to end in a Roman bloodbath, Parthian speed meant that Roman supply lines were really vulnerable. On the flip side, the Romans used hilly terrain and ambush tactics to their advantage, and their cities were nearly impenetrable to the Parthians. So I wish I had a more interesting story for you here, but it was basically just a two-century stalemate. Mm. Augustus tried yeah. to make peace, but Nero turned around and knackered it, so conflict continued, and in the later 2nd and early 3rd centuries, it only got fiercer. The Parthians managed to resist an invasion from Emperor Caracalla and company, but as the battles were very hard fought, the conflict left the empire in weakened disarray. This set the stage for the Sassanid dynasty to usurp power from the Parthians and create a new empire that would last all the way up until the Islamic conquest. 
still, the Parthians had a good run, did a lot of trade, and while the government wasn't as strong or effective as in Achaemenid times, overall things were still pretty good. For me, the coolest part here is the interesting incorporation of Greek culture into Persian in the realms of art, architecture, and literature, as well as a Persian cultural revival following the Hellenistic Age. It may not be Persia's most awesomest empire ever, but it's pretty damn cool. In 226, a guy named Ardashir from back in Ye Olde Persia, as in Persia before the Persian Empire happened, Persia, usurped the empire from the Parthians. Through a mix of military and diplomatic maneuvering, he established the Sassanid Empire and began a shift away from Greek culture back towards the more Persian stuff. That re-establishment of Persian identity was a dominant and lasting feature for much of the Sassanid Empire. As part of this, Ardashir instituted Zoroastrianism as the official state religion. And this is where the Sassanids start to look not quite so similar to the Achaemenids. In the Achaemenid <laughs> Empire, as we mentioned, things were fair and just for an overwhelming majority of people. However, in the Sassanid Empire, on Wednesdays we wear pink. Religious forces Why not yellow? Much more powerful, and them along with a growing. I'm not saying that the Sassanid Persian Empire bears striking resemblance to the bottom. <laughs> aristocracy puts some seriously unwanted pressure on non -Zora. You should have. You see, this would have been better if you'd colored them pink then instead of yellow. Even though I know, I think I know Sassanids are usually yellow. I think when represented on maps and stuff, but. For this, if you want to make, I feel like maybe you should have just colored them pink for the joke here. I. Astrians and non Persians in the empire. So the Sassanid Empire really committed to that pro Persia pivot. And as that distanced them from the notorious kindness and toleration of the Achaemenids, we should also note how the Sassanids are different from their predecessors, the Parthians. The Sassanid Empire saw a re-centralization of government following the broad localization, and arguably a weakening, of power under the Parthians. And after Shapur I took the throne following the death of his father Ardashir, the Sassanid Empire also found itself winning a series of wars with- Winning! Rome. Surprising, right? Well, though the Parthians were locked in a stalemate. Help! Everything is exploding with plague and our emperors keep getting assassinated by their own bodyguards. Made in centuries prior, Rome now happens to be going through a 50-year-long crisis in which the empire was in constant danger of collapsing. So 50-year-long crisis? Holy shit, are they talking about my life? The Sassanids were contending with a much weaker Rome, and they found much greater success because of it. The next famous Sassanid ruler was Shapur II, who repelled eastern invaders and strengthened Persia's overall military standing. He also helped consolidate Zoroastrian orthodoxy, which in turn led to greater social strife between Zoroastrians and everyone else. In particular, when Constantine declared himself the protector of all Christians in 313, the Persian Zoroastrians started looking at the Persian Christians really suspiciously, and hmm. then there were a bunch of persecutions. And also the increased religious pressure resulted in women having fewer rights, which is never fun. While Shapur II did do a lot to strengthen the empire against Rome and eastern invaders, he's an uncommon example of a king, or Shah in the Persian, who actively went backwards and made Persia a less tolerant and open place. And this all really went against what the Persian Empire was supposed to stand for. From the moment Cyrus established the Achaemenid Empire, he was fair and just to all. And even in the Sassanid Empire too, most of the Shahs were pretty good about maintaining equal justice. But between Shapur II, the strong Zoroastrian establishment, and the aristocracy, life was difficult for a lot of people in the Sassanid Empire for a long while. It wasn't until almost 200 years later, after inconsistent leadership and invasion from the east, that Khosrow I got things back on track. Khosrow consolidated power and diminished the influence of the religious establishment and the aristocracy, which helped put all of that strife we were just talking about on the down low. In their place, he instituted a system of bureaucrats who worked on behalf of the central government. This should hopefully start to resemble the Achaemenid system, so it should be no surprise that Khosrow is by far the most celebrated Shah of the Sassanid era. And here's my take on why. See, the Parthian Empire was still Persian in theory, but to me there's a lot of Greekness going on, so it's more its own thing. And most of the Sassanid Empire up until Khosrow was overly concerned with promoting that singular, unified Persian Zoroastrian identity in what's arguably an attempt to reclaim the greatness of the Achaemenids, but they missed the point entirely. From the very beginning, the point of the Achaemenid Empire was never about being Persian, it was about being good. Cyrus founded his empire on fairness and openness, and it succeeded because of it. Being Persian was always just a part of the empire's identity. Khosrow's actions made Persia more open, more centralized, more enlightened, and more in line with the ideals that made Achaemenid Persia so special almost a thousand years beforehand. In my opinion, Khosrow was a modern Cyrus. 
With that all said, let's get back to the events. Hmm. While Khosrow's reforms did a lot for the well-being of Persia, he also had a hand in a handful of conflicts. In the east and with the formerly Roman, now Byzantine Empire. You know, wars on and off. Khosrow broke a few treaties with Rome, so I'm back in some points. Fair is fair. Off treaties yeah. made and broken, land reclaimed from invaders, all that jazz. Later, Khosrow's grandson, Khosrow II, launched a huge series of campaigns in the west against the Byzantines, grabbing the Levant and Egypt and briefly poking up into Anatolia. In 627, the war ended and Khosrow was forced to give up the land he took during the war. Hmm. And this was pretty... Totally off topic, but the map of the aftermath of that war is one of my all-time favorite maps ever. It's just so pretty. It's pretty rough for the Persians because they expended a lot of money, resources, and soldiers fighting for what ended up being a whole lot of nothing. Eesh. Even worse, they could barely catch their breath before Muhammad and friends marched north. <laughs> and <laughs> Muhammad and friends, I love that. Invaded six short years later. The Sassanid Empire was crippled within a decade and wiped out entirely within two. I've covered some of the subsequent history of Persia elsewhere, but really, after the fall of the Sassanids, it's a revolving door of empires. Muslims, Mongols, and more. And it really shouldn't be a surprise that the heart of the Islamic Golden Age was Persia. I mean, a cultural heritage with a history of producing great works of art and scholarship suddenly becomes famous again for producing great works of art and scholarship? Mm. Definitely not a plot twist in my book. If you ask me, the Persian empires, and the Achaemenid Empire in particular, are nothing short of amazing. The works they accomplished and the culture they created is one thing, but I don't know if there's any better example of a civilization with such famously long-standing and successful commitment to justice, fairness, and openness. And to sand-powered time daggers. Gotta remember those sand-powered time daggers. Yeah, had with an all-white cast, pretty much. Love it. <laughs> All right, um, that was history summarized, ancient Persia. Now, I do have some things. Um, of course, I don't know enough about the Achaemenid Empire, so I, of course, cannot point out uh, off the top of my head anything that I know that would have been negatives about the ancient Persians because, of course, this video did feel like it was essentially him praising the Achaemenid Empire, which, of course, with all things in history, we all know that that is not the case with real life that with the good there comes the bad and of course in this situation blue mainly pretty much only talked about def definitely really only talked about the goods of persia he mentioned uh the ionian revolt which um i don't know enough about to really speak on but he said that was more the satrap and not the overarching governance of persia that caused that which of course you know I don't know enough comment we'll say sure but i would have liked um a bit more of a balance in in that instead of it just kind of being a a praising thing because and part of the reason why i think i do understand why he did this the way he did it because you a part of you wants to do that when something has historically been kind of in a way villainized and painted in a certain light you want to push back against that as best you can um however i don't think you should you know you should i don't think you should push back so far or where like you're pretty much only speaking positives essentially which is what this kind of felt like like there was one mention of a bad king uh after uh cyrus first um, came in and established the empire. There was Don or whatever, and then Darius comes in and does amazing. Or am I mixing them up? Was it Darius first and then Cyrus? I can't fucking remember. Um, so yeah, would have liked a bit more of a balance there on that. Um, but then again, this is history summarized, so you know what? Maybe it gets a pass. I don't know. But I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.